I'm going to talk about a couple of those so you can see how space technology is part of those sustainable development goals. And again, if you're interested in learning more, you can bring up that unusa.org website and see how you could be part of achieving those goals if this is something you're interested in. The first one I'll talk about is food security. We know that uh, a number of countries are uh, uh, facing food shortages, especially in Africa. And so we're looking at three different types of technology on this slide. On the far left, you see three entrepreneurs that I met in Doha. They were students going to Doha University, Qatar University, and they were majoring in nutrition. So they're not in the space industry, they're nutritionists. And what they wanted to do was come up with uh, a food, a healthy snack, that would use fruits and vegetables that are normally discarded because maybe they don't look perfect or they're uh, not the right shape or size. And so they'd be thrown away. And they took those fruits and vegetables and used NASA freeze-dried technology to now create a healthy, delicious snack that helps relieve food insecurity and creates more nutritional value and reduces food waste. In the center of the slide, on the top, you see Earth observation. So we're using satellites to look at uh, agricultural areas and crops, and we can determine uh, by imaging whether those crops are healthy, whether they need water or fertilizers, do they need pest control, are they going to fail? You know, we have some major drought activities taking place. And in the picture in the middle is Dr. Catherine Nakalibi, who was awarded the 2020 Africa Food Prize for the work she does in providing African nations with uh, space technology to help farmers increase crop yields. So directly related to Earth observation. And she is out of the University of Maryland administering the NASA Harvest Program. So I share that with you. She does do it in more than Africa, also South America and elsewhere. And then on the far right, the technology that's being used there is vertical farming. So we know that currently the methods we use for farming, um, using outdoor areas, clearing land, that is not sustainable. There's not going to be enough land for the population as it grows to 2050. We need to look at more ways to do agricultural activities and grow food in a sustainable method. So on that far right side is vertical farming, and this is an example in uh, Kennedy Space Center where they're doing vertical farming, which uses far less water, can use artificial lighting, artificial robotics, artificial intelligence. And so you can actually grow food closer to population centers, reducing the transportation cost, also reducing um, growing crops outside, using far less water and resources, controlling the environment, creating more nutritious food closer to the population source. Another activity we look at is water, the importance of water. And as we think about the sustainable development goals, clean water and sanitation is number six, but it impacts so many others of the sustainable development goals. And this is why in Africa, girls and women have to walk miles, sometimes four to 10 miles one way to retrieve water and bring it back to their families. And many times when they do bring that water back, it's contaminated. So it makes both them and their animals and families sick because they're using that water for their animals and for cooking. My good friend pictured here, Lumbi Mlambo, is a UN global leader in clean water and sanitation. And she's created a nonprofit to help drill wells or boreholes closer to villages in Africa. So women and girls only have to work, walk 30 minutes one way and back to retrieve the water for their families. Because when women have to walk four to 10 miles and retrieve water, they're not able to go to school or get jobs. So it pivots into those other sustainable development goals of increasing poverty, of quality education, of gender equality. So when we look at clean water and providing clean water closer to villages, it can also then empower women and girls to go to school and get jobs, helping to solve some of those other sustainable development goals. So the other thing is we have been recycling every ounce of water on the International Space Station for more than 20 years. We've been living in space for more than 20 years. So everything, you know, from you don't get monster in space, but from our activities in space, uh, we're recycling it and purifying it and then testing it to ensure we can reuse it. That same technology is now here on Earth. Uh, if you go into a hiking store, 
or an outdoor camping store, you can find filtration systems that are using NASA filtration system so that if you go hiking, you don't have to carry all your water with you. You can just use stream water or a puddle. You can filter your water and drink it. And you can also use that testing from NASA to test well water if there's been perhaps a hurricane or a typhoon that may have contaminated well water. So we're utilizing that space technology again every day to help improve the quality of lives. And of course, the last one I'll touch on for the sustainable development goals is affordable, clean, and clean energy. So we're looking at how can we increase uh, renewable sources of energy and one of those is solar energy. We've been using solar panels for decades now. And again, that came from the space technology. Uh, we use solar panels as we went into space, but they're, they're not as efficient as they could be. And so NASA is working to improve the efficiency as well as make them self-cleaning. Because on planets like Mars, dust, can, dust storms can last for months, cover a majority of the planet and can coat the solar panels, making them less efficient. And eventually the equipment uh, loses power that's not going to be um, sufficient or sustainable when human beings live on Mars. So one of the things they're creating is self-cleaning solar panels that will shake and vibrate to clean the solar panel. But it's also a technology we can use here on Earth because there's a lot of places we can put solar panels up that there's a lot of dust and debris and having self-cleaning solar panels would be really helpful. We're also looking at, as we look to create settlements on the moon and Mars, you know, solar panels may not be the most efficient uh, method of using them. So we're also looking at nuclear power, uh, both for those settlements as well as for long duration space flights. So again, we're looking at all forms of energy to help us accomplish both our space goals, but also we can use that energy then here on Earth to help us uh, achieve that sustainable development goal number seven. So I have another video I'll share about how space is part of our everyday lives. So again, you can see that space is part of our everyday lives. And for those of you, I know you're, you may be students or faculty and you're learning about how space is part of all the technologies we're part of. We talked about energy and food and robotics, but there's also uh, healthcare, you know, quantum, uh, artificial intelligence, robotics, advanced manufacturing, telecommunications, and more. So space is part of all the technology sectors we're looking at. So it's a matter of if you're interested in space and these technology areas, there could be a way for you to do both. And many times we think about space as a space economy, you know, launching vehicles, satellites, and that is certainly part of the space sector. And you can see that space economy sector on the far right where it says space. But there's these other sectors of the economies, such as agriculture and education and energy, government, public safety, the Internet of Things. All of these different economic sectors are also the space economy. So if you're interested in learning more about some of that NASA tech transfer, um, the patents that are available to be commercialized right now, NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, both have thousands of patents that are waiting to be commercialized. So if you're interested in becoming an entrepreneur, you can go to the NASA tech transfer office or the ESA office and you can see the website right there. So if you want to take a picture of that slide and check out those patents that might be available to be commercialized and you could see uh, maybe you want to uh, help 
continue to improve life on Earth with that NASA and ESA technology. So now what I'm going to kind of do is talk about the workforce, how the workforce has changed from 1960 to where we are today. So um, you can see some great pictures. We're looking at, you know, the Artemis. Uh, this is the Artemis generation, and it's the Artemis generation. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. So we had the Apollo era and Apollo putting a man on the moon and safely returning him to where we are today. So we think about that 90, 1960s workforce. We're thinking of, you know, two nations in a space race primarily government workers, male, and STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now we can tell from this picture, and if any of you have seen the movie Hidden Figures, um, we do know that there was diversity. There were women and African-Americans that were part of the space industry, but you know, as the movie highlighted, uh, they were less known until recently they were highlighted for their accomplishments and achievements in landing a man safely on the moon and returning him to Earth. And in this picture, there is one woman. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but she's right here in Mission Control. One woman in the sea of men STEM professionals. So this is what the workforce looks like today. You know, we're a diverse workforce, re multiple regions of the world, multi-generational, gender equality. You know, we can see uh, entrepreneurs and innovators. Uh, so one picture, you know, this is Egypt. We have uh, Space Latin America. We have Dubai, we have the US here at Space Foundations. Uh, we have a new gen program for young professionals in the space industry. So again, space is now open to all. Uh, this is my good friend, Ruvimbo Samanga. Uh, she is a space lawyer from Zimbabwe, you know, and I asked her about coming into the space industry and did she have any challenges? And of course she said, I had a few, you know, I had self doubts most prominently, but she did have social, economic and technical barriers to engaging in the industry. Um, you know, and it really took people to help break down those barriers for marginalized and vulnerable communities that still exist, especially in Africa, uh, South America, emerging space nations, but even in America, rural communities, inner city com communities, um, indigenous tribal nations. So we still need to look at how we create more access and opportunity into the space industry. Uh, we are looking at a diversity of skill sets. You know, we definitely need those STEM professionals, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. We still need astronauts and rocket scientists, but we also need those amazing technicians, you know, the manufacturing supply chain. We need welders and electricians and manufacturing sectors. And we saw a lot of them get impacted during COVID. And so, you know, here in the U.S., we're looking by 2025, we're going to be short 2 million workers in the manufacturing sector. And so that's one of the things that the U.S. is focusing on is rebuilding manufacturing in the United States to help uh, solidify not only the space industry, but the aviation industry, uh, pharmaceuticals, food, et cetera. So we need those manufacturing jobs as well. Uh, We'll kind of look at the diversity of careers. You know, again, we still need STEM professionals, but now we need astronauts to artists. You know, we got airline pilots, my good friend, Captain Franz, who's an airline pilot, but also an investor. We have entrepreneurs, we have policymakers, program managers, teachers. So if you're interested in the space industry, there is a place for you. And I have a video, it's a little dated, but it kind of gives you a highlight of all the careers or a lot of the careers in the space industry.
So it kind of gave you, there's a lot of opportunity in the space industry. So the next question you're probably saying is, how do I get in? What are the steps? So what I'm going to give you is a five-step workforce development roadmap to help you find your way into the space industry. And it, those five steps are awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. So that first one is what we're doing today. It's building awareness that there's a place for you in the space industry. So a lot of things I'll do and people at the Space Foundation or other space experts do is go out and kind of highlight that there's an opportunity for you to be part of the space industry. The next step is we need to create an access point. So programs like this help you become aware, but what are some access points? Well, I highlighted that if you want to be an entrepreneur and you don't know what you might want to create, uh, NASA or ESA could have a patent you could apply for and commercialize to bring forward. Or maybe there are scholarships or grants you can apply for. You know, some great uh, scholarships out there or Space Generation Advisory Council has amazing scholarships to attend some of their programs or maybe there are some fellowship programs. So finding an access point by getting a scholarship or an award can be really helpful to finding your place in the space industry. You can also then look at what are some training opportunities. And again, there's formal training, like what you're doing in university and colleges, and then there can be informal. Uh, could you volunteer for an organization that's in the space industry? Uh, Women in Aerospace Europe, uh, there, there's one organization that I know about you might be interested in. I talked about Space Generation Advisory Council. Maybe you can volunteer to start learning things, or you could get a fellowship or an internship. So you can get formal education, as well as informal education. And then building your relationships is so important. You know, I talked about some of them, Space Generation Advisory Council, the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs has some amazing programs, Space for Water, Space for Youth, Space for Women. So if you're interested in space and you're interested in any of those topics or others, Space for Law, you know, Space Lawyers, there's a whole program about space law you can go ahead and check out uh, unusa.org. Uh, the Space Foundation, if you're a teacher or very passionate and work with students, uh, you could apply for our Space Foundation International Teacher Liaison Program, another great program that helps connect teachers from around the world. Um, they get to participate in our annual space symposium complimentary and learn about how to bring space into the classroom. We have our Women's Global Gathering at Space Symposium. And again, women in aerospace. Uh, there's one in Europe, Canada, the US, Africa, Japan. So there's organizations you can join to help you come into the space industry and learn about it, ways you can get access and opportunity to find a career path. Another great way is to find some mentoring programs. So some of the great mentoring programs, Space Generation Advisory Council has a great mentoring program. Women Tech Network also has a mentoring program, and the UNUSA uh, United Nations Office of Outer Space for Affairs also has a mentoring program uh, for their uh, space for women. Now, just because it says space for women or Women Tech Network, it is open to men and women to be both mentors and protégés. So we need you to also sign up to be a mentor because you can be a mentor at any stage of your journey. A college student can help a high school student. High school student can help a junior high student. A college student can help me learn how to be more active on social media. How do I do reels? I've had one of my protégés help me uh, do more with reels on Instagram, TikTok. So you can be a mentor or a protege at any stage. So think about signing up for some of these programs to be a mentor as well. So again, that workforce development roadmap is awareness, access, training, connecting, and mentoring. So what are we looking at over the next 60 years? I talked about the last 60 years from the Apollo era to today. So where are we going? Well, we're going to look at teachers, families, and communities. So for individuals who might be on the call who are teachers, you know, again, the Space Foundation has our International Teacher Liaison Program, where we want to bring space into the classroom, make it hands-on, immersive, embrace technology, and make learning about space fun, engaging, and relevant. Many times when we think about space in the classroom, we're thinking about memorization, memorizing the planets, or it's what we did. 60 years ago, what we did with the shuttle and the Apollo era. It's not about what we're doing today, and it's not 
we're not talking about how space is creating all these jobs and the technology for the future. And so as teachers, we need to be embracing that and bringing that into the classroom and helping students explore that space is about the future. It's about being a part of the community. For those of you listening, you know, if you're a community a leader or act, activist, you can sponsor a school or a class or an enrichment program. You could, uh, you know, bring field trips to your facility so kids can learn about science and space in your facility. You could volunteer to be a guest speaker or a mentor, a role model, and you could be a science fair judge. So there's lots of ways that each of us can contribute to creating the workforce and the uh, unlocking that opportunities for others. And if you have families, you know, you can take your families out for stargazing, you know, and look at the planets. You can also go to science centers and museums. You can bring up the NASA or ESA website and look at some of the amazing pictures from the James Webb Space Telescope, or they even have material that can help you learn about space opportunities. So there's lots of ways that even families, we can connect with one another. So what I'm gonna do is take my slides down. Uh, we do have some questions and so we'll answer some questions. So there's one in the chat. Uh, why always the most advanced technology innovations are somehow driven by military needs in a way that the advancement is usually triggered by rivalry between the first world country's armies, which pretty much, oh, I lost that because uh, somebody added a question. Um, which pretty much makes the military the best hub for research. Worth mentioning that I believe that what they present to the public nowadays is old technology for them. They are in fact years ahead, but no one from the civil community is aware of classified research projects is the reason probably. I ask that question because the greatest achievements in aviation technology are historically linked to war, ballistic missiles, V2. That is a great question. So I'm gonna start with initially space was a, a uh, domain that was designed for all of us. You know, when we launched people to the moon and we put up satellites, they were not protected. They were not hardened. Uh, we considered it an environment for all of us. However, as we have seen recently with the U.S. standing up a space force and other nations doing the same, there are actors out there that can jam satellites, uh, that can follow satellites, move satellites out of orbit, and interfere with telecommunications and activity. So, unfortunately, some of the activities we see on Earth are transcending into space, and we are looking at creating an architecture uh, that protects um, all of those activities. But what I'll say is the Navy also exists to keep sea lanes open. And unfortunately, there are pirates that do capture ships, uh, cargo and individuals for ransom. And for those reasons, we have a Navy to keep the sea lanes open, to keep commerce going. So you can think of space as the same. We're going to be doing things on the moon and Mars, whether it's research or commercialization, and we need a, an organization, a government organization that helps to keep things fair uh, and create a level playing field. And so one of those documents, uh, UNUSA, the United Nations Office of Outer Space Affairs, does have treaties in place for the nations. Um, some of those are outdated and need updating. So again, if there's any lawyers here that wanna be space lawyers and policy makers, lots of opportunities for you to help us figure out how as multiple nations, right now there are more than 92 nations operating in space, how we're gonna all work together and be collaborative. But then we also need to look at uh, that commercialization will extend and create opportunities, but we also need to look at, there will be actors that could do things that could harm other individual satellites or commercial space stations or research facilities. One of the documents that's been created is the Artemis Accord by NASA. There have been over 26 signers now of that. Uh, I believe the most recent was Argentina. And that's a guideline. How do we work together as we go on to space as humanity? What are some of the rules of the road that we'll all agree to abide by as we create settlements on the moon and Mars and look to create habitats in space and create a cislunar economy? That cislunar economy is between Earth and the moon. As we create a cislunar economy, that will be a lot of commercialization. So we kind of need some rules of the road and how we can work together and be collaborative as well as be competitive, right? You know, companies compete. 
So we'll look at a different opportunity. So I hope that kind of explains a little bit that I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, we called it tech transfer, where government transfers technology to industry for commercialization. But there's also tech insertion where companies could have technology that's ahead of the government that could be inserted into government programs. And uh, NASA is a prime example. Their plans for the moon, uh, returning to the moon and staying, they show their architecture and where they have gaps in the architecture where they need support and ESA as well. So you can see where there can be both tech transfer and tech insertion and where commercial works with the government as well. So I hope that kind of answered your question. I saw an exactly, so I'll go with that might have answered it. Uh, we have a little bit more time. Does anybody have any other questions or does anybody want to raise their hand? Yes, I think uh, there is another question about the new technology which will be demonstrated with uh, Artemis. So Artemis is a really exciting program. Again, Artemis is based on the twin sister of Apollo. And this time, you know, the plan is to go to stay. Uh, on the moon and continue to have a presence with what they're calling gateway. So gateway is going to be like a satellite orbiting the moon where individuals can come and go uh, as they go down to the moon and come back to Gateway. Uh, Gateway won't be quite like the International Space Station for long duration stays, but it's more like a stop to go down to the moon and come back. And then we'll look at what are those commercial space stations looking like that will be put into orbit to replace um, the International Space Station. So there's a lot of technology involved. There's going to be uh, GM is partnered with uh, Lockheed Martin to create a new rover, a new moon rover. Uh, Toyota is partnering with the Japanese Space Agency on a moon rover. So you're seeing not only space companies leading it, but you're also seeing commercial companies like General Motors and Toyota looking at the parts and pieces that they'll provide to creating this future that we'll have living on other celestial bodies, such as the moon and Mars. So I hope that kind of helps a little bit, uh, but there's a lot of great opportunities. And again, a great place to look for those technologies is you can go to that NASA tech transfer site. Uh, you will see where there's thousands of patents, whether it's communications, healthcare, uh, um, agriculture, you know, lots of opportunities in agriculture and more for you to look at being part of the space industry. Uh, thank you very much for your answer. I think uh, there is not uh, another uh, no another question. We have uh, five minutes. If someone so, wants to ask another question, yeah. And if not, I'd be happy to talk about a couple of lessons learned. You know, I shared my journey. You know, it has three main chapters, mm -hmm. and in each of those chapters, I've had some lessons learned. Uh, you know, that first part of my journey. You know, when I uh, graduated high school and joined the Air Force as an enlisted person, and got to get stationed in Turkey and Germany. Um, you know, some of the things I learned was take advantage of every opportunity, and sometimes taking advantage of opportunities looks like work right it's volunteering for the hard projects it's volunteering for space generation advisory council mm -hmm. or to be a volunteer at iac the international astronautical congress which is taking place this year the first week of october in baku you know sometimes opportunities look like work but what they do is they give you experience and they help you meet other people and when you meet other people that can create new opportunities you didn't know about so take advantage of those opportunities one of the opportunities I took advantage was, although I had enlisted in the US Air Force to earn college money to go to school, I was able to go to school at night using tuition assistance from the Air Force. So that helped me to go to school at night. So yes, I went to school at night and I did homework on the weekends, but it allowed me to complete my college education debt-free going to school at night so that I was then able to apply to become an officer. So take advantage of those opportunities. I also would say try anyways. Sometimes we don't try for things because we don't think that we disqualify ourselves. And one of the things I'll share is I, my degree is in business. So when I applied to become an officer in the Air Force, I only had a 12% chance of being selected. But I tried anyways. And you know what? The first time I didn't get selected. But I tried again, I re-updated my application, I figured out how I could better present myself. And the second time, 
I was selected to become an officer and a space program manager. So try anyways, even when the odds are against you, don't give up. SpaceX had to try multiple times. They almost went bankrupt before they launched uh, a commercial space uh, company provided launches. And, and again, so don't give up. Try anyways, take advantage of those opportunities. And I look forward to sharing more lessons learned with you in the future. I think we're close to time if I'm correct. But before we end, um, could everybody, uh, maybe we, I don't know if we could do a group selfie on Teams, but I thought maybe we could do a selfie if people want to uh, come on uh, camera and we could use that NASA imaging technology in the in the selfie and, and capture a photo for all of us. What do you guys think? Maybe? Of course, yes. <laughs> so I will capture that photo here. So one, two, three. Fantastic. Well, if nobody has any other questions, again, I put the things in the link, how you can follow Space Foundation or myself. Um, keep going. Don't give up. Never. Uh, and failure. You know, failure is just F-A-I-L, fail first attempt in learning and so that's what the space industry is all about i look forward to seeing all of you around the galaxy thank you very much uh, for this uh, interesting uh, topic i think uh, i'm really also uh, 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 happy that uh, our students interact in uh, this topic. There is uh, a lot of things in Space uh, Foundation, uh, really. There is the Symposium 365 uh, and the Center for Innovation and Education. So uh, this is a very lifelong learning platform for the global space ecosystem that all students can uh, be profit. Thank you for the link also that you shared it with us. A very nice evening, uh, dear uh, uh, expert and uh, friend. We thank you very much uh, for your time and your availability for us. Very beneficial information and very important in our uh, career. Thank you also all the public and student present today. I wish you all a very nice evening and see you very soon in next uh, session of the conferences uh, next week with uh, another subject with uh, uh, Dr. Meryl Hook from Luxembourg Space uh, Agency. We will uh, uh, speak uh, about uh, aspect of uh, space safety and the opportunities in the space sector in uh, Luxembourg. Uh, thank you again and uh, have a good night. See you around the galaxy. Bye.